my honor and pleasure to be here with Professor Shaul Magi, who is the Jay and, and Jeannie Schottenstein Chair in Jewish Studies at Indiana University, and currently the NEH Fellow at the Center for Jewish History in Manhattan. Thanks for taking this time. No, thank you. So I know you're spending this year working on an intellectual biography of Mayor Kahana, and I'm curious what in, inspired you to commit uh, so much time to, to, to a project like this. Well, um, well, the, the my initial the, the the initial thing was that I, in, in my book American Post Judaism that I published in 2013, I wrote a chapter on the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wanted to address certain people talking about the Holocaust that we don't usually we don't usually hear from, and Kahana was one of the people I chose. So in doing that, I real I, rec I went through some of his material, and I realized that this is an incredible body of literature. He really literally wrote voraciously. Um, that was that just for some reason kind of struck a chord with me mm -hmm. as something that was kind of relevant and interesting to do. So I decided to kind of dig a little deeper. And I, uh, I had a graduate student from, uh, from California who was studying with me in Indiana that did an MA thesis on history and memory in Mayor Kahana. So we kind of, we basically took the time to spend about a year going through everything mm -hmm. chronologically from about 1960 to the mid-1980s. And I, re I realized that he is, uh, or was, I should say, an incredibly uh, prescient figure in America in the 1960s, um, speaking about issues that I think um, many Americans were actually worried about, uh, very kind of aligned to uh, a particular kind of reactionary politics that was adopting a kind of left-wing militancy that you found in the na black nationalist movement and things like that. And as I dug deeper, I, I decided that, that, that this, is, this is a kind of missing figure in, uh, in, in American Jewish history. I mean, people know about him, but if you look at most of the kind of histories of American Judaism, um, he's, he's almost completely absent. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I dug in, I decided to, to do this project, and I was lucky enough to get this NEH grant. And in the Center for Jewish History, the American Jewish Historical Archives and the EVO Archives have a lot of material. So I've been going through hundreds and hundreds of documents, letters, newspaper clippings. And I find that from the years of about 1967 to about 1973, I mean, he was just ubiquitous. He was all over. He was in the New York Times. You know, he was in the Daily News. He was in regional Jewish newspapers. He was speaking in synagogues and day schools and middle schools and reform synagogues. And... Every across time, the denominations. Across the denominations, yeah. and every time I go speak about Kahana, I will invariably have somebody come up to me afterward, doesn't make a difference where it is in the country, and they'll say, oh, you know, I was in middle school out in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, mm -hmm. in seventh grade, and he came to speak to our Hebrew school class, right, right? about Soviet Jewry, or about Israel, right. Right. or about something. Um, and and I, in general, you know, I, I just... Feel in my just my intellectually and I think politically and personally kind of attracted to 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 radical Jewish thinkers or radical thinkers in general. And he really is he really was a Jewish radical in a way that we don't usually think about Jewish radicals because when we think about Jewish radicals we usually think about people on the left. Right. But he was really a Jewish radical on the right before there actually was a Jewish radical. Left, <laughs> right. right. So what what happens in your conservatism in the seventies and eighties is something that he was actually talking about in the nineteen sixties. So um, I think of a, a lot of mainstream Jewish leaders being being aligned with him early on, and then later distancing themselves from him. What was kind of that moment, or or what was the experience that 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 put him on the outside a little bit? Well, that's a good question because you're right. I mean, people as prominent as Emanuel Rachman, yeah. who was then the rector of the university and then later became the president of Bar Ilan University, was a member of the JDL, the Jewish Defense League. Um, and many others, uh, many other prominent figures as well. What really turned, there were a number of things that, there was one incident that turned, that what, what turned was a bomb that went off in the Soviet embassy offices that mm -hmm. killed a woman mm -hmm. that um, the JDL never really took responsibility for, but it seemed pretty clear that they were involved. Mm -hmm. I think that particular moment was a moment when a lot of the people who were more mainstream um, decided to kind of part with him. And that was really like in seven, if I'm not mistaken, 70, 71. Now what's kind of interesting about that is that 1970s when the Weather Underground was formed. Mm. So you have this real move from the late 60s, from the, from the emergence of uh, the new left, black nationalism, and then you get to 1970 and 71 and suddenly there's a real militant turn uh, among the left, the Weather Underground being one of them. 
And the JDL was also a part of that. So what ends up happening is when they start getting involved in the Soviet Jewry movement, which is actually quite late, everyone kind of thinks that the Kahana was at the, at, the, at the vanguard of the Soviet Jewry movement. Mm -hmm. The Soviet Jewry movement really starts in the early 60s mm -hmm. with people like Yaakov Birnbaum. It's not until really 69 that, that Kahana basically decides to get involved fully in the Soviet Jewry movement. So he's really kind of a latecomer to it. But once he comes in, he begins to kind of take over the movement and he begins to organize civil disobedience, violent protests and so on. And I think it, I think it was really the, viol the overt <laughs> violence mm -hmm. that, really, that really caught him to, it caught, that really caused a lot of the other people to, to separate. So earlier on, he was, when he was organizing civil patrols in Boston or in East Flatbush or in Crown Heights, I mean, those things, there were a lot of Jews that were very sympathetic. You had elderly Jews who were living in, 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 in difficult neighborhoods, and you had these people that were going around protecting them. I mean, right, right. So, but when it started to become much more, much less defensive and much more proactive in Soviet Jewry, that really kind of... I think was, so when I, when, when I think of his legacy, I, I mean, I think of him as an activist, not as a thinker. Right. But you're saying he was, um, he was constantly writing. And I think of his followers as having been, perhaps this isn't fair, as kind of primarily anti-intellectual to a certain degree. So, so who was reading him? And, uh, did his ideas have an effect? That well, that's a really good question. So who was reading him? First of all, from, from until he resigned, or actually was fired from writing for the Jewish press, uh -huh. which is a Oh yeah, which was the which right. was the kind of large Brooklyn. Based. Although they, they he's he's uh, been revived though. He's been there. revived there. He <laughs> was right. He was writing every week many articles under different names. Very often. Right. Who was reading him? It's a kind of interesting question. He was being read by a small group of people, but his influence was really his activism and I think his personality right. too. I mean, right. it was a certain kind of magnetism that he had, especially among young Jews, young mm -hmm. Orthodox Jews, mm -hmm. young Orthodox Jews from. Um, uh, families of survivors, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, people who were part of the radical left, mm -hmm. who basically moved away from it after mm -hmm. 1965, 1966. Um, and he also had actually a lot of kind of white collar, middle aged people like, like Bertrand Zweibon, who was a lawyer, mm -hmm. uh, who was a co-founder of the JDL with him in 1968, mm -hmm. and other people like that, who basically were, into, they, 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 they bought this product of Jewish pride, right? Because this was an anti-assimilationist movement. It wasn't only about, you know, being anti-black nationalists or Soviet Jewry. I mean, this was about fighting assimilation. It was about fighting American uh, was, liberalism. Uh -huh. Right. Uh -huh, very interesting. Right. So we've been talking about America, but I know roughly his last 15 years were spent in Israel. Right. How was his influence in Israel different from the States? And what's the, what's the relationship between those two, right. those two communities? So he moves to Israel in 1971. Mm -hmm. The reason that he moved to Israel, it's unclear. You know, it seems likely that there was, uh, he was convicted of arms smuggling in 1970 and there was, yeah, he got a suspended sentence. And he moved to Israel probably to evade other kinds of indictments okay. because the JDL started getting into all kinds of issues of, you know, bomb making and arm smuggling. Uh, yeah. uh, but once he moves to Israel, he kind of sets up shop there. His, his intention, his little intention to move to Israel is I'm going to set up an international JDL that's going to be based in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. right? That never actually happens. But he does write a book called Our Challenge, I think in 1973, which is his kind of program for the future of Israel, mm -hmm. runs for the Israeli Knesset under this under his the party of Kach, doesn't get elected a few times, and then finally gets elected. Uh, at the same time, he's spending about half of his time in America, and he's continuing to write books in English for American Jews. So I think the the, 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 the thesis of the book is that he really is an American Jewish thinker, even when he moves to Israel. He's never really accepted in Israel, and the reason why he's not accepted mm -hmm. in Israel was not because of his radical politics, mm -hmm. it's because he was really an American political thinker. He just kind of translate, right, right. translated the identity politics uh -huh. of the 60s, you know, so that the, 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 the Arabs just became the blacks of Israel uh -huh. for him. So, so, I mean, how much of the vision is just about survival as uh, compared to some sort of utopia that he can imagine, whether right. that's a Zionistic vision or something right. else? No, that's a good question. So he, he was really, uh, and that's, the, that's actually the, the subtitle of the book, uh -huh. uh, it's called Mayor, Rabbi Meir Kahana, Rise and Fall of American Jewish Survivalists, because oh, okay. it was really about survival. Uh -huh. and, and this notion of, He thought there was a threat. There really he thought was a threat. that there was yes. a physical threat uh -huh. and, and basically spiritual threat, a, a spiritual threat too, and he was a survivalist, and that, that happens in Israel too. I think the interesting thing is that the survivalist 
the survivalism is something that has to, has to my mind taken root and still remains in the American Jewish conversation mm -hmm. today. I think American Jew uh -huh. Ju Judaism right. has taken this survivalist right. turn. So we talk about continuity, right. but what we mean by continuity is really the survival of the Jews, right. not necessarily the survival of Torah right. or Judaism, but right. the survival of the Jews. And I think that was his main message. So one of the interesting things about his Zionism is that he doesn't write a lot about Zionism before he moves to Israel. When he moves to Israel, his Zionism is very separated from the religious Zionism that is emerging at the time. He never writes about Rabbi Abraham Isaac Cook. He never writes about Speed. Okay, there's no interest right. in that romantic messianic. Uh -huh. Right. Oh, he's just he's he's an empiricist. He's uh -huh. a materialist. He's right. a survivalist. Right. Right. So he doesn't have any interest in that now. Post Kahana Kahanism, like after he dies, there is a Kahanism that emerges that emerges in Israel. That's an amalgam of kind of Cookian Messianism and Kahana survivalism. And I think that's what we're seeing in some of these um, some of these more radical groups. People like the kind of the, the Hilltop Youth and the people that mm -hmm. are illegal outposts. It's this um, it's this amalgam of this kind of survivalist militancy with a kind of romantic messianic. Utopianism. So he wasn't really a utopian in that way. Right. Uh, and then, you know, once the Knesset mm -hmm. removes him because of, through this racism law, mm -hmm. he writes this book called uh, Comfortable Questions, uh, Uncomfortable Questions for Comfortable Jews in 1987, where he basically says survive, uh, Zionism is a failure. He really becomes almost like a, huh. a militant post-Zionist. Wow. That Zionism is just Hellenism and the whole, the fact that they rejected him was a rejection of Zionism. Uh, and he really then becomes much more apocalyptic. So his later works, for example, a book called 40 Years that he wrote while he was in Ramla prison after being arrested in Israel for arms smuggling, mm -hmm. is just this apocalyptic commentary on the book of Ezekiel, talking about you know the need for violence, which is very different than the violence of self-defense that he talks about in mm -hmm. America. So, so how, how, fast forward in 2017, yeah. how does his thinking and the work of JDL inf inform what our religious political discourse right. looks like today. So what I think is that the, the tactics of the JDL, the militancy of the yeah. JDL has really disappeared. But the militancy, uh -huh. the militancy of the JDL is largely a product of its, of its times. Right. I mean, this was the late 60s. This militant groups were emerging right. all over the place, right? Yeah. But I think the worldview, and this, this is what I'm trying to get to, to, to put forth in the book, the worldview of Kahana, the worldview of the perennial existential threat, the worldview of anti-Semitism as something that is simply hardwired into the DNA of the Gentile. Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. um, the worldview that, uh, that, 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 that Jews are, the, the survival of Jews are threatened. That worldview, I think, is actually very, very deeply embedded in the American Jewish conversation. And you would say he was a significant figure in that. I think yeah. that he, I, I wouldn't say that Right. Like people in right. the ADL or Kahanis, right? right? I mean, they're, they're not that. Right. Right. But I think he began talking about something that then became marginalized because of its tactics. But the actual ideological position that he was espousing is something that had taken root. And I think that is really part of what, uh, what, what, what the right and left in American Jew, an American Jewry is really battling now. The, the notion of anti-Semitism, for example, mm -hmm. um, the threat of anti-Semitism as it exists in the left, yeah. right? That is something he was talking about when he was talking about the, when he was talking against the Black Panthers, right? right? So I think that that in a way, um, you know, you you have in Israel, you know, there's all this graffiti, you know, uh, Kahana Sadak, right? Kahana was right in Israel. I think in some way there's, there's a way in which that it's true in America too, mm -hmm. that American Jews are saying that too. Now, the fact is people aren't reading him, right? right? right. And that's hopefully what this book will be a contribution. I mean, I've actually read him carefully, yeah. and I'm, I'm going to try to tease out the ways, partly the ways mm -hmm. in which what he was saying in terms of ideo ideologically, not necessarily tactically, is something that we should take very seriously because I think it's really actually unconsciously a part of what mm -hmm. we think. So my last question, uh, a personal question. Was there anything you read that you were surprised to find you aligned with um, that you actually found to either be inspirational or informative or did you right. was everything sort of on a, on a polar? No, so that's a, that's a good yeah, question. Yeah. I, I think what I found to be, what I to be fascinating about him is that he had a certain kind of uh, intuitive ability to locate hypocrisy, 
And I think what Kahana did in the 60s was basically put his finger on the hypocrisy of the American liberal Jewish establishment. Uh -huh. It was a critique of liberalism. Uh -huh. it, it was a critique of assimilationism. Right. So he writes a book, uh, which is uh, Why Be Jewish, which is a, basically a book about assimilation that's based on a 1972 television series called Bridget Loves Birdie. It's called Why Be Jewish? Yeah. That's interesting, because uh, Edgar Bronfman yeah, just wrote a book on the same time. Yeah, yeah, right. Well, I wonder if he knew that. David yeah. Wolpe also wrote a book called Really? Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. So, he, so but Bridget Loves Bernie was a one-season show. It was the first season, first show about intermarriage yeah. in America, yeah. about Bernie Steinberg, who's you know Jewish parents, and, a, right. and, and, and Bridget, who's the daughter of a Roman Catholic family, of which family? And the, the show was taken off the air because the American Jewish establishment pressed Hollywood so hard against having such a show. Mm -hmm. And Kahana's book is basically, I don't understand why the American Jewish establishment was against Bridget Loves Bernie, because the American Jewish establishment created Bernie. Mm -hmm. right? Bernie is the American Jew. Mm -hmm. right? Right. So he was able to kind of, the, the, his critique of liberalism, I think from a reactionary yeah. uh, position, is I, very attractive to me and useful as a way of thinking about right. liberalism. Right, so when does this book come out? <laughs> <laughs> That's the question I can't answer. 1819, no, 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 no. and it's called the... It's going to be called uh, Mayor, Rabbi Mayor Kahana, The Rise and Fall of an American Jewish Survivor. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank, Thank you, you so very much. much. Thank you so much.